Hello and welcome to our lecture tonight. We have two speakers tonight, Phil O'Dell and Matthew Parr, speaking about the Rolls-Royce Axel and the world speed record for electric powered aircraft. Matthew Parr is the Customer Business Director for Rolls-Royce Electrical. Rolls-Royce Electrical is a newly formed business within Rolls-Royce Group focused upon delivery of complete electrical propulsion systems to the general aerospace market, such as urban air mobility and computer aircraft, commuter aircraft. Matthew is also leading this highly specialised charge to build the world's fastest all-electric aircraft. With a technical background in electrical engineering as well as project management, he is responsible for the delivery of this high-performance zero emissions plane. Currently based in the UK, he has had 10 plus year career in strategy development and R&D portfolio management across Nordics, US and Singapore. Previously undertaken roles supporting executive leadership teams in establishing, communicating and deploying an effective vision and strategy. Our second speaker is Phil O'Dell. Phil has currently just landed and is racing towards his house to join the lecture today. So we've just got Matthew at the minute, but Phil should be joining us. So Phil is currently the Director of Flight Operations for Rolls-Royce PLC. He's flown a wide variety of aircraft bearing from the Rolls-Royce MK XIX Spitfire the Airbus A380 and the Boeing 787 due to the iconic Balkan XH558. Before joining Rolls-Royce, Phil was officer commanding the research and development flight of the Fast Jet Test Squadron at Boscombe Down in Wiltshire. He joined Rolls-Royce PLC in November 2001, having completed 18 years in the Royal Air Force. Since joining Rolls-Royce in 2001, Phil has contributed to a number of major engine development programmes, in particular the Ador MK6951 upgrade to the Hawk, the Trent 900 for the Airbus A380 and the Trent 1000 for the 787 Dreamliner. In the last year, he has been the project pilot for Project Axel, Rolls-Royce all-electric aircraft, the spirit of innovation that is hoping to shortly break the world electric speed record. Phil is also the chief pilot of Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight and its Spitfire operation, a great privilege that requires flying the aircraft at a number of air shows and events throughout the UK each year. Outside of Rolls-Royce, Phil is an ambassador for Fly to Help, a wonderful charity that allows adults and children to experience the freedom and advantages of flight. He is married to Lizzie and they have three grown up children. His hobbies include reasonable golf, poor drumming, appalling skiing and passable walking. I'll now hand over to Matthew for the lecture. Enjoy. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we're going to talk about a really exciting project today. Um, I have to just quickly make a, 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 a new introduction. Um, I have my own mini project with me today, a project with hands and feet, um, who, who's hopefully going to be quiet for most of this presentation. If not, I will be quickly dropping her off um, with her mother, but it's, it's my allocated time and anybody who's doing uh, homeschooling and having managed that through COVID, sort of will appreciate you have to do your bit. So Bob, yeah, she's with me and she'll, she'll be she'll be perfect. I it's it's fantastic to talk to you today on this project. It is a amazing activity that's been really I've been really proud to be part of for the past almost three years now. Um, so this this is our aircraft, the spirit of innovation that we're showing on the picture here. Um, it is unashamedly been 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 um, styled slightly towards the um, the supermarine um, S6B aircraft, uh, and really when we when we started out with this project, when we when we set out to go and break the all electric speed record, we we spent quite a bit of time thinking about what were the aims of the project, and and one of them was really coming out was was the culture of a startup, the culture of an organisation that works with a single purpose, that's very agile, that is that is driving. Uh, towards innovation but 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 you know, say just one principal aim and an objective to go break an airspeed record um, and we looked back a little bit at the Rolls-Royce heritage and we, we we really fell in love with the story of the supermarine and the Rolls-Royce involvement in, in the Type R engine that of course went in, into that aircraft so so back in the 1920s 1927 um, the, uh, the the supermarine went and won the Schneider Trophy uh, with a with a Napier Lion engine in it, and at that time the, the, uh, Mitchell, the designer of the aircraft, made what was considered a sort of really courageous move. He 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 decided to move from the Napier engine, which had really kind of reached the end of what they, they felt could be achieved out of the engine, and go to Rolls Royce and say, "Hey, can you make make us an engine to go break some airspeed records?" And and 
by that point of the Rolls-Royce heritage sort of time, it was we were really an automotive company focused quite heavily on automotive, dabbled in aerospace, but decided you know we we're going to going to charge towards automotive as the key industry. So it was a bit of a pivot for the organisation to start to scale up a team, start to focus on you know how how we, how we create this engine to go to go in the aircraft, and a lot of um, uh, really a lot of innovation was achieved in an incredibly short amount of time because the team had this impetus, this goal to, to, to go to go win a race. And, and of course, they won 1929, they won 1931. If you won three years in a row, the rule is you get to keep the Schneider Trophy. So if you go to the Science Museum today, you can see the Supermarine, you can see see the Schneider Trophy there. And we, and we just looked at that and we looked at what that small team was able to achieve. We were really inspired. And that that really that ethos that 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 that, that using competition as a as a driver innovation we, we grabbed all of that and as we started to think about the project so when it when it came time to designing the livery for an aircraft would you know what we grabbed those radiator grills off the side off the side of the supermarine and we we strapped them on our aircraft we took the um the sort of friendship colors of the of, of, of the tail and then put them on the uh, on the back of the aircraft as well but hopefully you agree it's it's just a beautiful looking aircraft so the, the project, as I say, is, is, is all about how do we go and, and, and build the world's fastest electric aircraft. But it's it's not about going fast. Of, of course, we want the record. It's, 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 it's the, the driving objective for the team. But, but principally, it's about the innovation that allows us to go fast. And it's that innovation that, that, that underpins a, a kind of a shift towards sustainable aviation. So. For Rolls Royce today, you know, we focus on sustainable aviation in terms of investing in our, in our core in the gas turbine. The more efficient we make the gas turbine, the less fuel it requires, the more sustainable it is. We we invest in and, and partner for sustainable aviation fuel, and and, and look at that as, a, as an option to reach net zero. But we also invest heavily in disruptive areas like hydrogen and like electrification. And with this project, what we really wanted to show. Was and hopefully inspire people was what what it what can electrification really offer what 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 is state of the art today and try and paint a picture of you know what what we think we could achieve 2024 2025. So this is really an aircraft that was set out to be a pioneer to, to talk about that third age of aviation, that, that more sustainable, more electric age and, and demonstrate Rolls-Royce's commitment to, to that vision, as well as, of course, accelerating the uh, sort of innovation, accelerating Rolls-Royce's understanding of, uh, of, of um, batteries, most, most notably, but also electric motors, power electronics, cooling systems, thermal management, all the challenge you have when you, you try and package a, a really high performance um, powertrain into such a small Small aircraft. Um, so the, the top speed of the aircraft is, uh, we're, we're saying it's about 300 miles an hour plus. Uh, plus. So you know, we're, we're out to break the record. The record today is, is held by Siemens. Uh, it's 210 miles an hour. It was set in uh, 2017. We're out to go and really smash that. You know, we, we didn't want to go 220. If we went 220, somebody else was just going to go 230. So we wanted to go out and set a record that really demonstrated we're pushing what, what this what this technology can achieve. So we've got a fantastic powertrain, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit more detail in, in coming up. But but essentially, high level, it's 400 kilowatts. So it's about 535 brake horsepower. It's uh, got a 72 kilowatt hour battery in there. So that's sort of the same as a Jaguar I-Pace sort of battery uh, size in it. It's got a range. In, you know, in the most in the most economy setting of about 180 miles, um, but realistically, when we go do that record run, we're going to go through that 72 kilowatt hours of energy in about eight minutes, and it's it's that ability to discharge all that power in such a small amount of time is which is where all the engineering challenges really came in around thermal management, etc. And the aircraft itself is it's, you know, it's it's an incredibly lightweight aircraft. It's 1,250 kilograms. And what that's allowed us to do is operate under some fantastic legislation in the UK called E-Conditions, um, which is which has really put the emphasis onto us Rolls-Royce to, 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 to define the safety case, to define what it takes to go operate this aircraft um, safely in an airworthy fashion, 
and, and, get, and, and also put that kind of responsibility on us as well to be thinking about what, what are the new requirements we're going to have to see in future electric aircraft because there is no regulatory body today that has a set of requirements on the shelf ready to go when you think about this complexity of this system and all the new technologies in there so we get we get to kind of get that challenge as well so yes you know we, we hope to go inspire you with our new fast electric plane but I, I really want to underpin there's just so much innovation in here and so much innovation that's directly relevant to what Rolls-Royce wants to do in, in urban air mobility in, in the commuter market space, which is which is how we think we can start to push sustainable aviation in the kind of 2024, 2025 timeframe, uh, rather than you know the next single aisle aircraft, et cetera, which is which will be coming a little bit later after that. Um, so just, just to walk you quickly through uh, our propulsion system. Um, so we have um, selected a kit aircraft um, to, to use within the project and it's a fantastic kit aircraft. It's a kit aircraft uh, got for, called the Sharp Nemesis NXT. Um, it is a proven racing aircraft. In fact, it's the fastest aircraft in its class. So if you put an internal combustion engine into this aircraft and, and, and operate it as, as, as John Sharp did, it goes about 400 plus miles an hour, but it was operating then at um, conservatively people think about sort of 700, 800 uh, brake horsepower, so much higher than, than the sort of power levels we're going to get out of our propulsion system in the aircraft. But we have a few sneaky things up our sleeve, which I'll explain, which should make us a bit faster than, than, than necessarily you would get if you just if you just did those trades. Um, we have a single propeller on the front um, from, from MT, and then essentially behind that though, we have three fully independent galvanically isolated propulsion systems. So three completely electrically, mechanically independent propulsion systems. Um, so we have three motors from Yasa, uh, which is an Oxford based um, motor and, and drive company, really focused on the automotive market and, and using this project to get some understanding of, of what it takes to win in aerospace. And this, this project starting um, in, in June 2018, when, when we announced it uh, um, at Farnborough and we we stood on a stand and said, hey, we're going to we're going to come back in two years with the record. Okay, we're running a little bit late, um, but we, 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 we had we had the ambition um, at that point. Rolls-Royce was yet to acquire the Siemens E aircraft team. So we've got, you know, essentially at this point, a very comparable motor portfolio actually within the Rolls-Royce um, group now as well that, that could be deployed. But we started this project with Yasa. We're really proud of the motors and what they're going to do in this, this project. We're going to we'll be flying with those Yasa motor, uh, motors proudly. Um, so three Yasa motors on that common shaft to the motor uh, to, the, to the propeller, um, but then three sets of power electronics and then our, our fantastic battery. So our battery comes from our partners in this project, Electroflight, who are uh, an energy storage sort of aviation startup, really focused on taking automotive technology, taking the state of the art of automotive and thinking about how do you apply that into aerospace? So for Rolls-Royce, this was a fantastic opportunity to work with a with a, with a new organization, with a really startup culture, with a, with a, with a but with but with a great foundation in energy storage technology from the sort of the team's experience in places like Williams Advanced Engineering, like uh, Proteon, the sort of a lot, of a lot of the major electric vehicle sort of companies, bringing that together to now think about those aerospace challenges. Um, are you know? Everyone's going to tell me quite quickly batteries are heavy and they're right, you know. So when you when you look at the sort of the total weight of our aircraft, about half of just under half of that is the batteries in this system. But don't forget, of course, this is a tiny aircraft with one person, one pilot sitting in it. You know, it's it's it was we were always going to end up in a situation where it was a battery with wings strapped on. But the, the fundamental bit that we, we, we've hit on and I'll talk about a little bit is we've got to that energy density. We've got to that power density numbers that you need if you want to read across into urban air mobility exceptions and sort of, sort of other, other, other opportunities like that. Um, so this is our battery and I'm, I am not going to bore you at all by reading all the numbers on, on the right hand side uh, of the chart, but I'd just, I'd just like to reflect on a couple of things quickly as, as we stare at this. So we, we started this project in, um, let's say in, in June 2018. And we've been really open, I think rightly so, when you think about the aviation industry and where it is right now. We've been really open that this total project has cost about um, six million pounds. 
uh, and 50% of that we've been really lucky to have funded through the UK government. Um, so the sort of the, the, the bill to Rolls Royce has essentially been a million pounds a year to, to, to develop this project and, and, see, and see it through. And if you if you look at where we started at the beginning of this project, the, the, the automotive industry and the batteries they were rolling out at that point were about 120 watt hours per kilogram. So that means for every kilogram of battery, you get 120 watt hours out of it. And you know, the automotive industry, excluding Tesla, is, is not really in the battery game, right? It, we buy our batteries, they buy their batteries from, um, from people like LG, Panasonic, Samsung, and, and they integrate them and they package them. And when they buy them in, they buy them in actually at 220 odd watt hours per kilogram. So as they go through that packaging activity of getting it in the car, worrying about safety, etc., they basically halve the energy density of the battery. And when you think about aerospace, we just can't accept that. We can't accept that much packaging weight to enable, enable our aircraft to go flying. So what we did within this project is the industry baseline is 100, you know, 120. We, we went out and said we need to get somewhere between 165 and 180. Um, we didn't quite get to 165. We ended up at 155. But I'll explain some of the reasons why on, in a second. But we did that. We went we went from you know 50 50 packaging weight to sort of 65 35 packaging weight. Um, in, in two years with a focus on energy density and, as I say, spending about six million pounds. Over that period, over those two years, the automotive industry announced close to 90 billion dollars of investment into electric vehicles. And they've gone from 120 to 165 watt hours per kilogram in those two years. So our team has done a phenomenal job at really thinking about how you package batteries in a higher density way, in a way that's aligned to an airworthy and, 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 and an aerospace standard. So I think what, what is a phenomenal ticket value. Um, and we haven't just designed a battery, of course, we've thought about cell selection, we've thought about manufacturing, we've manufactured this battery in house together with Electroflight. We've, we've, you know, we've, we've, we've built the composite storage box that sits around it that gives it its structural integrity. Um, I'll talk about some of those elements in a second, but just a phenomenal amount of innovation that's gone into this battery to produce what it is today. Uh, and it's it's you know it helps, of course, it's incredibly beautiful to look at it and you can you can see some of the pictures of it sort of sort of going going on the bottom. Um why 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 is focusing on batteries the right thing for us to have done in this project? Um there's a lot of you know the, when we when we looked at this and we looked at where where it, you know, what what is going to unlock that speed record it's really the energy story it's how do you get enough energy on board to 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 drive the propulsion system to the powers you need to for long enough for you to secure the record so securing the electric speed record is actually not not as simple as just going kind of straight down the course three kilometers. Uh, a run that, that we're, that we're going to go break. In fact, it's a three kilometer course. You have to pass over the course four times and it's the average speed as you as you go along that course that, that gives you gives you the record. And we we therefore need to spend a lot of time making sure that we could sustain that power safely over the whole period. We couldn't just do one run at full pelt like you'd want to and then just idle around up there. It had to be continuous power delivery across the profile. So we spent a lot of time focused on we know the battery is going to get hot. How are we going to keep that battery safe? And one of the real the sort of key learnings out of this project that I'm really, really proud to share with you today is, is the way that we took that kind of aviation defence and layers mindset and started to apply it to kind of an automotive derived battery technology and, and look at what does it take crucially to deliver aerospace solutions going forwards. So we spent a lot of time as a team thinking not only about um, about the, the, the overall pack, but in fact, the individual cells, the chemistry that was in that cell, how we selected that cell from a, you know, from a very credible supplier, how we, you know, the secret source of how do you integrate that cell into the pack that the electrified really brought, then how, how are we going to monitor that cell? So how are we going to do a, a management system, a battery management system that gives us all the data we need to know about, about battery, about the battery and its use? How are we going to operate it? What are the profiles we're going to fly? And then in the absolute worst case, We've designed a, a, a casing for this battery that not only hangs the motors off the front of it, so it's a structural part of the aircraft, but 
actually will contain a battery fire for for, for, the, for our worst case situation, which is about 10 minutes. Um, so we've, we've designed a battery case and, and some great IP in the lay in the um, the linings, etc., that we use inside that battery case to 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 manage. If we do have a thermal runaway event, hey, we can contain it. And we were doing all this activity in parallel, and of course, many of our peers are also thinking about these sort of challenges for projects like EFNX. And we're really proud that we we got to a solution that that, that works, and and, and that we, we we demonstrated to the extent of actually setting cells on fire inside the box and confirming, you know, ultimately that it, it does it does the job that it needs to do. Um, so I. I'm really keen just to give you a really quick overview of you know what why why this project and why this project now. Um, so for for Rolls Royce, we've got a, we've got a new team inside Rolls Royce Rolls Royce Electrical, um, and that team is really focused on as I say on, on on the commuter market, on the urban air mobility market, and the small propeller market, sort of two to four seats trainer aircraft type market space. So we're really off focusing on. You know, the disruptive space as we see it in the market right now today and and to do that we are we're focused on taking prototypes and turning them into our worthy products we're focused on the innovations you'd expect us to be in electric machines and, and power electronics and batteries and, um, and, and and all the ancillary systems that we need but we're equally really focused on collaborating so when we look at this market we see lots of new entrants. We see new entrants from automotive, from multi-industry and startups. And one of the things we really wanted to demonstrate with the Excel project is, is we Rolls-Royce are growing. We Rolls-Royce are, are able to work with new partners, with organizations that look and feel very different to us. We can work with startups and hopefully get to a relationship that's mutually benefit for both of us. And um, equally, you know, when you think about that challenge of electric aircraft and, 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 and urban air mobility, these air taxis flying around, it's not just a challenge anymore of the propulsion system that goes in the aircraft. It's the whole whole ecosystem of, you know, how do I even buy a ticket to go on that aircraft? How does that aircraft interact with air traffic control? Where's the charging infrastructure for it where it lands? How you know, the, 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 just the whole the whole piece of operating an aircraft and, and that all needs to evolve over the next two years. And we need to be agile enough to work with it as well. And so really, as an organisation, we put all of that together in what we call championing electrification. Um, so as I say, we, we, rolls Race is now focused on investing in a portfolio for small propeller aircraft, urban air mobility and commuter aircraft. So we, we're entering that CS23 market space. And really, it's, it's a portfolio of batteries, motors, power electronics and everything you need in between to sort of connect that all together. And it's a portfolio that is um, actively being grown today. So we're really looking at solutions that we're going to bring into the market the middle of this decade. And you know, I'm going to talk through some of the sort of the great examples of how we're really starting to make a position in the market. And and and, and, and we are you know, fundamentally we're very serious about taking a leadership position in this place. And in fact, I would say today we are the leaders in this place for the electrification of aerospace. Um, so. These are a number of platforms that you, you may have heard about that are, you know, all, if not quite flying, almost about to be flying. So Rolls-Royce today has flown more than 1500 missions of all electric aircraft. So we're already credible in this space and, and we've flown more than 150,000 kilowatt hours of, 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 um, uh, of, of electric propulsion system experience. So phenomenal amount of capability already in the company, actually learning how, how you deliver these systems. Um, Hopefully you will have seen last week that we entered uh, together with vertical aerospace Rolls Royce has now entered into the urban air mobility space. So this this aircraft out of vertical aerospace, it's, it's, a, it's a Bristol based organization, will be powered by a Rolls Royce electric propulsion system. So that's our motors and inverters that Rolls Royce will be delivering on this platform um, to, to lead through to its full certification and, and, and entry into market. And we're really proud to be working with vertical on this. Um, we also announced last week um, that we are working with Technum together with Vidro to look at a 12 seater aircraft, which, we, which is called the P-Volt, to do a zero emission uh, uh, flight operation. So this is an all electric 12 seater aircraft to be used uh, in the first case of Vidro in Norway to look at those sort of short um, hops that they have in sort of the, the island routes essentially, but an aircraft we think has great potential into highlands and islands routes into anywhere where you're doing sort of, you know, 20, 30 minute stage lengths essentially uh, and, and really start to get out there and, and demonstrate um, what, what, what electric aviation can enable. 
another project which you'll hopefully see flying um, towards the end of this year with Technum, looking at a hybrid aircraft. So this is a this is a Rotax engine coupled with a Rolls-Royce motor in a parallel hybrid configuration where the motor essentially provides boost capability during takeoff, go arounds, any, any climbs, etc., as, as the pilot requires, recharges during flight the, the onboard battery units, so is available for a go around, etc., when you, when, you, when, you, when you come into land, and is really looking at basically how, how much can we reduce the emission profiles, how much can we improve the efficiency of this aircraft but through, through that hybrid system configuration. And one of the larger projects we're running at the moment is called the Arpus I-5 project, which we're doing in Germany, where we're taking the Rolls-Royce helicopter gas turbine, the Model 250, really robust, really well-proven gas turbine, and coupling it with state-of-the-art power electronics, generators, rectifiers, motors, inverters, batteries, all into a novel aircraft platform to go and demonstrate Rolls-Royce's competence and capability to produce series hybrid systems, not just to do a prototype flight, but to think about certification of that entire system. And, and, and really, it's a extending the supply chain, looking to work with a whole new set of companies to work out what it, what it takes to get to, to really deliver in this, this space. And you know, fundamentally, just a really exciting platform to be, to be, to be focusing on as well. I was hoping at this point to hand over to Phil O'Dell. Um, has Phil joined us at all yet, do we know? Yeah, he's, he's managed to uh, reach us. I'm here. Fantastic, fantastic, Phil. So, Phil, um, you, you did have the longest intro of anybody ever, 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 ever. So you've got a lot to live up with now. <laughs> but, um, gonna, if I hand over to you to talk about the flight operations of the Excel aircraft. That, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It looks like I've just gone live. So, um, hello everybody. Uh, apologies for being late. I don't know whether that was uh, transparent or very well hidden by Matthew. Um, I've seen a number of very interesting things today. I've had a very busy day flying. However, that's all been topped. That's my first presentation um, by a father and daughter. Um, that's stunning, Matthew. And and Olivia is so well behaved. So, um, hey, um, I didn't dress for effect. I apologise. I've literally climbed out of an aeroplane, jumped in a car, driven a little bit down the motorway and um, roared to a halt um, just here to talk about flight operations. Um, no pictures, just just a bit of chat, but uh, about where we are on flight operations for the uh, for the project. We're, we're deep into preparation, preparation, preparation. Um, we're, as you would expect, as we're duty bound to do, taking it very seriously. It's an incredible opportunity um, for us in flight ops, and we're remarkably aware of how much effort has gone in from so many other people and, and don't want to let people down. So, um, a lot of thoughts gone into to COVID and the effect of COVID. Um, you know, what is it? What has it meant to us as we prepare to fly this? What are we missing? And you can imagine Rolls Royce generally is talking about the effects of COVID and its effects on our operations, in flight operations, in our operations in in, in the build line, in our in our um, in the areas that are designing, the areas that are putting together, and, and what are we missing, and what are what are the weaknesses, what are the threats that are against us, and 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 there's a number. Um, a lot of people talking about the water cooler effect. So if we don't stand around a water cooler, bit of an American expression, but it's I think it, it's very clear. And we're not talking in the way that we used to. We're we're talking in Zoom, in in you know this this new order and this very new way of communicating with lots of advantages and and. At every stage that we've seen problems, we've seen difficulties with COVID, and, and it's been an awful time for so many, and I'm very conscious of that. There are opportunities and there have been advantages and some quite incredible things that we've noted to to our to our to our benefit. But so there's no water cooler. We're not standing in rooms, we're not communicating in the ways that we have been. Um, we're not as tight as we used to be. What effect is that having on 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 our, our progress on the on the um, project? Um, I flew a little bit under 15 hours in the last year. That's that's extraordinary. That's dreadful. So how do I get back up up to speed? Well, we made we sat down. We put a lot of thought into that. Um, very early on, we realised it was recoverable. 
but we would have to clearly start flying and we'd have to get very smart about what we do in that flying to get ready to go and fly um, <clears throat> Axel. Axel's difficult aeroplane to operate. Um, I can't see anything. Um, it, it's by far the least visibility I've had. I'm almost lying down in the aeroplane, so, so it's a very alien uh, uh, environment. Or well, that's at least the way we went into it. It's incredible how it's become uh, through all the ground testing we've done, and, and I'm, I'm not sure if Matthew showed a video or if the video comes after me, but but um, we've taxied it now, and it actually became a very friendly, a pleasingly friendly, and there's a really exciting feeling of, uh, of actually it's comfortable and it's right, and everything's in the right place, and the throttle moves beautifully and smoothly, and all my interaction with it is, is very positive. I've been accused of being a marketeer, and um, you would say that, wouldn't you? Um, which is a great shame personally because it's very very genuine a bit more of that um and on so we've gone through that phase of preparation what are we missing what are the threats against us because of covid because of the lack of flying we're doing because of the the the, the pace at which we're moving relatively three years can sound very slow but it it's for what we've achieved and how we've stretched ourselves in that 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 time it's very quick. So what have, what have we done in flight ops? So um, I've renewed my flying instructor's rating and, and taken that as an opportunity, not directly ben beneficial to this, but it was an opportunity to look in depth at spinning, departure, and 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 when an aircraft departs, which is for, for those that aren't um, pilots amongst, amongst us, is when I lose control of the aeroplane effectively, when it's flying me, or not flying, and, and and I'm not in control of it. How do I recover control, etc.? Um, the the Nemesis, the the NXT has some interesting stall characteristics. It's one of the most aggressive stalls I've seen, and and with it came a pack of a packet of advice for a number of people about how you avoid the stall, um, how you land it to avoid the stall, and various elements but we've done uh, a lot of focus and a lot of training on on what the industry is calling uprt upset recovery training so we've looked at, at, at um, close to and pre uh, stall and, and departure and spin training we've done an awful lot of that some very interesting personal elements to that um hadn't spun for a for a while because we hadn't flown for a while and, and you get all the physiological effects of that we went up and spun four times a, a week ago uh, and came down and felt dreadful for quite some considerable time. And, I, and I've done quite a lot of aerobatics in my life. I've never been a great aerobatic hound, but uh, was quite surprised by how um, how ill candidly I felt for, for, for a period of time. So we've looked at that, we've looked at ways around that, we've looked at programs to, to get back up to speed, to, to sharpen up. We use the CAP-10 that we have on the flight ops team with, with, with Rolls-Royce. We use that for high speed practice force landings. So the CAP-10 has a 76 knot glide speed if the engine stops. This, and we're not entirely decided where it will be, but it's at least 130 knots, possibly, probably closer to 150. And there is some talk of it being even faster than that in that environment. So we need to take aeroplanes like the Cap-10 and simulate gliding at much, much, much higher speeds. Something we've done. We then moved on and we've flown the extra 300. Um, for those that, that aren't aware, an extra 300 is a two seat, uh, fast, agile aeroplane, a little bit faster than our Cap-10 that we've been using, capable of 150, 160, 170 knots. And we've been using that to practice force landings. We've been using that to practice a lot of spinning and a lot of departure training and a lot of landing techniques. Um, when I come into land in Axel, um, I can't see a lot. So I'm using a lot of peripheral vision. So the runway choice is, is very important. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we're going to Boscombe down. Um, but, I, um, but I also rely on a, on a landing technique where I fly it on, avoiding Although it's tailwheel, avoiding the classic tailwheel three point, stall it on with a with about a foot to go at all costs, because it, its wing drop characteristics and its general stall characteristics are um, aggressive to, to 
say the least. So we've been practicing that in the extra, um, spending a lot of time feeling for the ground, and the extra is very good for that. Limited visibility, much better than Excel, but it's still limited. Um, and flying that on a variety of runways, wide runways with with lots of definition. So I've got lots of peripheral, uh, and um, we landed yesterday on on one eight at. Um, sorry, 3.6 at, uh, at Gloucester, which has very poor definition, very narrow runway. So trying to, to, to pick up experience, currency and, 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 and practice. And then we'll go and fly the Spitfire. Um, Cap 10 and extra uh, around 150, 160. So they're about half the speed we're going to be doing in Axel. So the Spitfire, uh, which is three quarters, probably further through its winter maintenance, um, we'll be able to get to the 260s, 270s, um, so very close to Axel speeds, and, and it's a very good opportunity to go and practice the profiles. We started looking at the profile, um, clearly a lot of focus on first flight and the next trips, and we're now starting to look in a lot of detail at um, the actual profiles we're going to fly for the, for the records. It, it almost felt wrong to to start thinking about those until after we've flown, but clearly we want to get ahead of ourselves. There's a, a lot of effort gone into trying to get ahead of ourselves, quite um, um, quite a lot of, uh, of thought and, and open. And, and, and at every stage, we've tried to be desperately open. So if at the end of this in the questionings, people have ideas, thoughts from experience, then, then chat them at us, chat them at us. Um, and equally, one of the things we've realised I think I've known it for a long time, but but it's been borne back to me that, that our history and our heritage is useful in our, our present and our future. There aren't many things that have gone wrong in the present, and, and I believe that's true for the future, that haven't been in some form analysed, looked at, learnt in our, in our past, which is a big shout out for the Rolls-Royce Heritage Trust and the value that they've brought to, uh, to all of us. So getting back, just started playing with the profiles. It's a three kilometre run uh, with a kilometre on either side. We go one way, back the other way, back the other way and back the other way. So four times three, three kilometres. And we're starting to look at that. Um, we're doing it in a 150 knot aeroplane. And, and so quite simply, we've halved the, halved the distances. We're flying a one and a half kilometre run with 500 metres at either end, so the cadence is the same. It won't look geographically the same, but we're trying to experience the turn rates and the feeling and the cadence of that and, and experiment with the heights that we're going to fly it at and the way that we're going to turn the uh, corners. I'm not sure if Matthew mentioned, but we've got a number of Red Bull people on the team from the Red Bull Air Race series that are advising us. Um, and uh, some world experts helping us with that profile to squeeze that little bit more out of it. And um, at full power, those ridiculous levels that, that, that we've talked about, um, we've probably got about an eight or nine minute um, in endurance. Um, when John Sharp used the internal combustion version of the Nemesis, they took about 20, 25 minutes to uh, to establish their identical record. Uh, we've got to do it in half that time, so um, I've got to sharpen up. Um, what else have we been doing? We've been looking at everything, basically, um, examining everything, trying to be better, not interested in being the best because that's actually quite limiting, trying to be better in everything we do. Um, we, we've looked at the way we run our checklists. We're using some electronic checklists. We've invested a lot of time um, and um, an effort into producing an electronic checklist to get us in the right place to make sure we make no mistakes. We've got a little haptic watch which alerts me to, to, to various things, so some um, nudge technology. Um, collision avoidance, we've been working with a, a number of systems that some of you, the pilots and most of you will be fam familiar with, like uh, PFLAM, Sky Echo, and, and working so we get a collision avoidance. Um, clearly, we'll be operating out of Boston Down where there's there's radar, but um, um, anything we can do to to give me extra and and Steve Jones, the other pilot, extra capacity in this in um, in and around the flight test and then the race attempts. Uh, we've been looking at that, and we've also um, been looking at some mind and body stuff. Um, not something I normally 
um, talk about, but I, I've had to lose quite a lot of weight. Um, I, we sat in a couple of weight meetings and went around the room and the motor guy said, can't get much out of the motors. They are what they are. You know, commercial off the shelf, might be able to do a bit here with the wiring to the motors and various things, probably get grams out of it, can't get kilos. You know. And then the battery storage guy went, yeah, we can do a bit with the casing, we can shave a bit here, we can scallop, we can, we can probably get it down to um, by a kilo and a half, maybe one point you know, four kilos. And meanwhile, I'm <laughs> kind of sat there going, I know where this is going. And I think some of you will have heard me say this before, basically we went around the whole room uh, and I just went, I've probably got five or six kilos I can offer. So by far the biggest weight saving came down to me. So I've almost got close to, to 10 kilos, scarily, as my as my contribution. But that's been um, a lot of time in the gym, which I'm not, um, I don't gravitate towards naturally. Uh, I think that would be fair to say. But also something we've done in Flight Ops, which traditionally Flight Ops hasn't done a lot of, is a lot of mindfulness and thinking and preparation and how we slow ourselves down, how we think thoughtfully, how we, we go into it with a with a very positive mindset, how we encourage others, how we admit our failures uh, and how we interact, which has been fascinating. Uh, and the last part of that that we're starting to look at is is startle effect. You know, if something goes pop, bang, whiz, you know, how am I going to react to it and how do I deal with that that um, reaction? Um, got a number of uh, friends in the industry. We've got a little group being put together um, as we as we get into the last part, the build up to the actual race attempt, attempts and 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 what we do um, from. We've got a couple of special forces guys who have obviously dealt with startle factor. We've got some very experienced pilots that have been involved both military and civil in those environments and people with the experiences and stories of you know, what to do and, and how to best drive your way through um, um, you know, that, that effect, startle factor. You know, when it goes with pop bang, what am I going to do? I'm pretty confident that it won't. Um, we've talked about thermal runaway, we've talked about the battery containment, you know, I've got 10 minutes to get the aeroplane on the ground, which is generous. Um, um, although all my timescales are shifting and there's a lot of focus on, you know, thinking in smaller timescales than, than perhaps I'm used to. Um, and, and uh, you know, getting very close and that expectation, that excitement, you know, all of that is is building and also hence the mindfulness about trying to put that to one side and just focus on the job in hand. Um, we taxied it recently, as you saw, which was a great event. You know, any aircraft moving under its own power, when it's a 787, when it's a, when it's an A350, it's, it, it, you would have thought it was different, but all the emotions were the same for just moving this under its under its own power for the for the first time. And it crazily, um, it, it was one of the most exciting and memorable flights I've ever had and I didn't and I didn't get airborne. We did, we had a small practice before the papers and the press arrived. We promised ourselves absolutely that we wouldn't do it for the first time in front of the press and, and we nearly had to. Um, and so we had the added pressure of that but it, it, it was really positive to be able to send that message as well. Um, it, it, it's fascinating watching the press coverage. It's fascinating watching the number of people that say, why are they wasting money doing this? And it's even more pleasing watching the people jump on top of them and go, no, this is, you know, think back in history, think of, of the Wright brothers, think of and, and how people have grown. You know, and, and you've seen from Matthew, you know where this is going and it and it's 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 very real um i think that's probably enough for me um there's a few more things from the flight ops which we can talk about perhaps in the questions i mean it's it, it's interesting the differences uh, one of the most uh, notable things so far is you know on that taxi we were using a runway to taxi up and down a taxi to the holding point i sat at the holding point i came back to idle on the throttle, which is the propeller turning slowly and went, why am I doing that? Why don't I just stop the propeller? So I come back to zero, propeller stops. Reaction from people around me is, oh, what, Something, something's gone wrong. No, I, 
you know, why sit here with a propeller that's turning? Um, some interesting debates there. And we're starting to look at that from a from a flight ops point of view in Rolls Royce with so much future product about how we advise um, uh, how we deal with that in flight operations. And there are differences. None of them are mountains. Um, the, the, there's some hills to, to get round or get over. Um, and it's just because it's different. There's nothing that's um, insurmountable at all. And it's simpler in many areas. Not all. There's a couple of little areas where it's it's a little bit more complicated than an internal combustion engine, but we're doing work and people like Pipistrol, who have a commercial electric aeroplane, have done some great work in that in that environment. So I think I think that's it from me on a flight ops, and I'll hand back to Matthew and uh, Olivia. Um, uh, and and we'll take questions. Thanks, Phil. Um, so we've we've got a short video we'd hope to share. Um, there, there is there is a historical inaccuracy in the first 20 seconds of this video. So the first person to kind of get on the chat function and clearly identify what it is, we'll do a behind the scenes FaceTime call or something. We'll show you around the hangar and show you what, what's getting up for one day because we are sorting it out. So apologies when you, you, you it, it's amazing the nonsense that can come out of your mouth when somebody puts a camera in front of you and asks you to try and speak eloquently. So I apologize to everyone, it is me, it's in the first 20 seconds, but the video thing still still holds together, so let me, let me try and play it. Okay, um, Phil, can you just let me know whether the audio comes through, because sometimes it doesn't. No, I don't think it is because it's not coming through this end. Just give me one second. If you look at the bottom, it's embedding fonts. Hopefully that works. That work. Not yet. No, give me a second because I was definitely talking. It's Teams. <laughs> give me a second. Uh, so if I stop sharing. Apologies, everyone. I need to tick this little. Yes, I want to share. I need to tick this little box saying include system audio. There we go. And then rewind. Full screen. Play. Full volume. That working? One of the great points of Rolls-Royce in our heritage, of course, is the Spitfire and, and the Griffin engine that went into the Spitfire. And this was a point where Rolls-Royce invested in a racing engine, invested in an engine to go break at that, at that time, airspeed record. Rolls-Royce bring a century's worth of aviation excellence and combining that with Electrolyte's uh, pace, agility, hopefully this will be sort of one of the first aircraft that is known as being innovative in electrification in this century. Project Axel has been going for three years now. I was there from the very beginning, I was lucky enough to be around when the first people started talking about the concept. It was uh, three people walking into this, this very building, sat down, got the laptops out and started work, and now we're spread across the two hangars here. So our, our aircraft, the Spirit of Innovation, is a, is a unique aircraft that we developed specifically to go break the airspeed records. We knew from the beginning it would drive us to think differently, to have to work differently, to have to innovate differently. It is one of the most complex kit aircraft that is out there. So we've got 6,000 battery cells all connected together to an electric motors to deliver more than 500 horsepower. But the project's not just about going fast. The project's about the innovation, about the technology that it takes to go fast. And we're really proud that actually our project overall is going to be net carbon neutral. It's about inspiring a generation of people and proving that electrification and that strategy is here to stay. We need to get to this stage now, getting the team together we've got uh, in Electric Flight and have the involvement of Rolls-Royce. Such an amazing project, so exciting. One of the key milestones of the project is, is the taxi test. This is an incredible time for the project. The first taxi, the aeroplane moving under its own power for the very first time. It's the pilot and the aircraft on their own, 
the aircraft moving under its own power. Which is a huge milestone for any aeroplane and its travel. We're at the very edge of some incredible technology. The rest of the team will be looking at data on our telemetry system. But really, it comes down to, have we built an aircraft that could do what we said it could do? We're entering incredible phase. Project what it means as part of the journey for the next generation. And to be able to look my own children in the eye and say I'm sustainable, you know, I'm driving to carbon zero in electrify and Rolls Royce doing that doesn't get any better than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll, we'll hand over the questions now. Thank you both. What a great lecture. We're so glad you made it fill after your quick dash. <laughs> and this is the first time we've had a lecture from two people, well, three, <laughs> with your little one. <laughs> so we've had a couple of questions come through already, but please feel free to ask any if you've got any now. We've had one from Rick Parker, who I believe used to work for Rolls Royce for a long time. So it's great to see you joined our lecture today. And his question is, should you have set your target at beating the spe speed of the Spitfire at 369 miles per hour? <laughs> Do you want to, um, am I live as well? Or um, voice wise? Yes, you can yeah, both are live. Heard as well. <laughs> yeah, my um, I, I don't know whether that's Matthew or whether that's me. Um, 369 um, would have been too, too gutsy a start, um, and I don't think we'll quite get there. Um, you know, we've always said 300 plus. Um, you know, when you bear, bear in mind that the Siemens record is 213 miles an hour, uh, or our record, as it as it actually is. Um, although I, I feel that's a bit disingenuous. It's very much Siemens and the Siemens team clearly that that, that brilliantly broke that record. So uh, it's a lovely idea, Rick. And, um, but I'm, I'm, yeah, that's, that's next year's project. Yeah. So we, we want to push to go as fast as possible. Absolutely. So we're, we've said 300 we've, we've, and we've got a, yeah, we've got a clear statement of intent there. We're going to go try and go as fast as we can. You know, what would I, what's in my heart? What I would, what would I love us to do? Actually, I, you know, I'd, I'd love us, if we could, we can't, we can't, you know, I'd love us to go 407 and a half because that's what the Marine, uh, so the Supermarine S6B did 1932 when um, the, when they were basically instructed just to go and go as fast as they possibly can, you know, in, in, in almost in a straight line. Um, we can't do that. Um, but what I love us to do, well, I kind of reflect that the, the, the kind of the fastest electrical vehicle on the planet today is the Buckeye Bullet. Um, uh, Venturi book I bullet in the States at 340. I would love us to go that fast. I would love us to beat that and I mean position of, of us having you know such such, such the fastest electric anything on the planet but hey I, I you know we, we're really we're focused on 300. 300 really sets a high benchmark um, and we're, you know the team's all aligned to just try and get going as fast as we can. You've, you've been rumbled Matthew, looking at the um, Merlin before Griffin. Um, Griffin's quite a hard word to spell. Um, can I just jump in? Rick asks is another great question about um, uh, visibility. Uh, we have a camera. Um, we have a taxi camera which is mounted in the tail and, and gives me some line up. Um, uh, and that is displayed in the cockpit on my main central, what's called my PFD, my pilot's flight display. Um, we need to do a little bit of work on that. It wasn't working terribly well for the taxi trials, but but we didn't delay the taxi trials as a, as a result because we had a nice um, um, wide runway and some mitigation. Um, it's perhaps why some of the videos are slightly offset from the center line. Um, but uh, yeah, so great, great suggestion. And we're there, we're there ahead of you. We have um, we have a taxi camera. Um, 
in a much better place than the internal combustion version we flew two years ago, which had a very poor screen off to the right hand side, which is not where you want it. Sorry, Amina, back to you. No, no worries. And then we've had one from Fred saying, great presentation. Just wondering what cells you're using to achieve such good energy density and AC discharge, obviously with intensive cooling. Um, so we're, yeah, so this is a really great point. So, so when you think about the aerospace market going forwards and its role, or the role of sort of the systems integrators, we, we're quite clear that we want to have a role in terms of how do you package that battery, but we want to be able to be relatively agnostic to the cell providers um, and to, unless until we start to see, of course, a clear differentiation that supports uh, aerospace, whether that's in you know, established supply chains that meet certain aerospace standards, etc. As it stands today, there aren't any. Um, but we, we so we we are using um, the Murata 18650 cell. Um, it's called the the VTC6, um, and it is um, the a re really high performing cell. Um, it's got a great balance between energy density and power density. Um, but its primary application actually today is, is, is predominantly uh, Dyson and power tools. So it's the same sort of cell you would find in a, in a Dyson a vacuum cleaner or, or you would find in a Bosch power tool. But, but it was a strong emphasis from the team that we needed a, a battery that was commercially available on the market. And the, the battery market today um, is basically, from a commercial level, is structured around selling millions of batteries. So when we went to the Maratta and said we want 20,000 batteries, you know, we all, we had to do a bit of a show and tell. We actually had to get the Maratta sales guy to the to this is you know, this is 20, 2018 to, to the London Rolls Royce London offices and woo him into you want to supply cells to this project because it it's just a, such a you know just a completely different part of what their business operating model is. But yeah, Maratta VTC sixes. Thank you. And we've had a question from Mike Percival, who I believe is the global head of manufacturing engineering at Rolls Royce. So it's nice to see you as well tonight. Saying, how does the visibility out of Excel compare with the Spitfire? It's a lot worse. So the Spitfire visibility is not great, but um, I can open the canopy in the Spitfire, which allows me just just that couple of inches of movement of my head in either side, allow me to look down the side of of, of the Spitfire. Our roll, well, sorry. Yeah, the, our Rolls Royce Mark 19 Spitfires um, uh, actually got a bigger power plant ahead in the in the Griffin, but actually some of the visibility is easier in a Griffin um, in comparison to the Merlin, um, which surprises a lot of people. Um, but Axel's harder. Um, in the in the Spitfire, in the Spitfire, I'm sitting in a fairly normal position. As I say, I can move my head a bit. I can weave very comfortably. In Axel, weaving is very uncomfortable. Um, and, and because as soon as I, I in Axel, I just want to go in a straight line, hence why we've got the taxi cam. So if I'm on a taxiway or a runway with a very clear centre line, you know, white paint on a black background and it's not worn away, as a lot of their fields you know, markings have done, seem to have done more recently, uh, then I'm really comfortable. But as soon as I move, the reason I don't want to weave an axle, as soon as I weave, I don't know where I'm going and my visibility is a lot worse. In fairness, my memory from flying in America in the internal combustion version that we went and flew, as I said two years ago, was actually not quite as bad when we got into um, uh, the taxi trials, which is why I was able to continue despite the taxi cam not being at its absolute best that it will be by the time we taxi again um but it's yeah it's pretty bad and i'm 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 not quite lying down but i'm raked back and, and that's quite an uncomfortable to move your neck in that environment uh, and i've got a big hulk of air airplane in front of me so quite a bit worse than the spitfire and and uh, um, you know the most awkward airplane um and, and with quite a lot, you know, if I were to taxi into the grass within five minutes of my first taxi. So I've got through one personal um, um, milestone. Someone was asking me about nerves as well. And yeah, yeah, I do get ner nervous, um, but nervous is good. Um, and, and hence the mindfulness about treating. And, and somebody also, sorry, I mean, but somebody I was reading the question, somebody also asked about mindfulness in aviation generally, and it's huge. 
it's a really good question. Absolutely and utterly huge. It's a it's a very target rich and thought rich environment, and I wish we'd been doing it for 20 years and and, and you know, very, very powerful mindfulness being in the present and knowing what that means and slowing yourself down when you want to rush finding ways of slowing yourself down and getting thoughtful and I haven't cracked it yet by a long way it's easy to talk about it in this environment and sound knowledge and got a lot to learn and we're trying to employ that across all the different aircraft types yeah I rushed this morning I found myself rushing in a cap 10 and, I, and stop breathe be in the moment slow down because uh, there's you know I am acutely aware of how much money money's not quite as easy anymore but money is money you know it's people's lives that have gone into this airplane and i yeah yeah let's not dwell on it i am aware thank you then we've got one from gwen saying how does the accumulation of mass at the front of the aircraft change the weight distribution relative to the combustion powered aircraft and how does this affect the stall slash recovery characteristics I, I, I've explained this to you many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, what is it? I have to say here. Um, so this will be a double act between um, between Matthew and I. And the reason we chose Axel uh, or the Nemesis NXT because we had a pretty good feeling that it would sit really comfortably. Um, you know, when we moved the battery around and when we moved the rotors around, uh, motors around, and it would work, and it has worked almost perfectly. We've got the CFG and um, obviously with quite a lot of thought, but it wasn't. Yeah, it all just worked really. Everything slotted into the right place the, where we've got the battery, where we've got the motors, where we've got me minus a couple of kilos. Um, you know, we're in a in a slightly better CFG, we think, than the internal combustion engine versions. Um, weight has been a challenge. We've talked about that. Um, and, and obviously weight is different because we're not losing weight throughout the flight as a as a, a, a conventionally powered aeroplane would. But it, it we just chose the right aeroplane. Um, and, it, and it's worked out really well and we haven't had to wrestle. We were worried at one point the CFG was going quite a way forward and, and that clearly would give you know, that was quite worrying for me in the landing and well in all in all parts of flight. Uh, but it's just worked out, hasn't it? Matthew, anything you want to add to that? No, uh, other than to say you know, it, it's it's just it was just one of the first key engineering requirements and the team have just focused on it relentlessly all the way through. The characteristics Phil described made the aircraft a really great choice. But you know, as, as we all know from any engineering project, you've got to stare at weight as often as you can. Thanks. And just touching on that, Phil, someone said they're very impressed with your 10 kilogram weight loss especially with the gyms closed, if you've got any secrets to share. <laughs> They're not as impressed as I am, or my, my, um, trust me. Um, yeah, it's easy. You persuade your wife that she can park her car on the drive and you can convert your garage into a into a gym. And then we've had another one saying, what are your next major milestones and when do you hope to do the airspeed record flight? Go on, project manager. <laughs> So um, we're looking to move the aircraft to Boscombe around the end of April and then get get flying in May and get the, the airspeed record in the first half of this year. Um, so we're, um, you know, it's, it's still fundamentally an innovation project. So so we still have bits and pieces we want to get absolutely right in the, before we transition to Boscombe. Um, and we um, selected Boscombe for a number of reasons. But we, you know, one of the great things about going there is it, it's the home of UK experimental test flight. So you know, it's been a while since it's had that role, um, and it's just a, it's just a fantastic location to go to and kind of do to do the first flight from. And we can close it as well for the period of the flights. So we will we will be the only people um, we will be the only people flying from the airfield for the, certainly for the early flights, if not all of them. And and it's hard to do that anywhere else. Boscombe is very. Um, understanding, very focused, very used to that because of the number of, of first flights they've had from Boscombe. So nice long runway, 10,000 feet long, which is good for the record run as well, the three kilometre record run at least. And, um, uh, and, and and just a whole air base you know, that we feel are with us. Uh, it's really been quite 
superb, isn't it, Matthew? That you know, we feel that they're rooting for us as well, which is um, um, great. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're being absolutely amazing. So they we're basically we're getting we're getting our own air, 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 hardened air shelter that we're going to operate out of. As he still says, closing, closing the wrong way down. Even sitting there patiently explaining to the project manager how the radio system works so we can drive cars on and off. So, so yeah, they're being really supportive. Um, and so just I just think that home of UK experiments test flight, the UK funding in this project, it just it just all fits together in a really nice way. Thanks both. And just touching on the record breaking, somebody said eight minutes isn't long. What altitude will the record be set at? That was by Richard Williamson. Uh -huh. um, I, I, around a thousand feet. So we have to be below 500 meters. So 1,635 feet, something like that. It's a bit more than that, isn't it? Someone's going to correct me now, but we were looking at it yesterday. So we have to be below that. Um, and um, so we're going to, on the very first, pre the first entry to the gate, we're allowed to be at any height we like. Um, however, we can't be because we've got to manage the power. Um, at absolute full speed, then we have to manage the power uh, very carefully. So we'll climb to probably three, maybe four thousand feet and then dive on the gate to get some speed. And then we're locked below 1500 um, feet, uh, 500 meters, so 1600 and something. Um, uh, and we think we're allowed to lose uh, 100 meters. We're not quite sure. We've gone back to the FAI for clarity. We're not sure if that's per run we can lose 100 meters, um, so 400 meters, or whether that's over the whole record attempt, which would sound fairer and right. It's meant to be a level flight record. So um, uh, we've gone back to them for clarity. Their rules aren't clear. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll, we'll start at 1450 feet, something like that, and we'll finish uh, if I get it right, at about a thousand feet. But if the terrain it, varies, and and sorry, just to add, that is over um, an average between the two three-kilometer gates, and, um, and and the train around Boscombe. We were looking at it today as we flew past Boscombe. Um, rises in certain places, so um, and 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 clearly we have some rules. Civil Aviation Authority rules, although we're working very closely with them. So, um, yeah, so a uh, bit of work to do there. And then we have. Oh, sorry. Two more. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just going to add that the um, the rule set's incredible. Right? The rule set is 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 has been around for decades. So the the lovely thing about going to break an FIA record is it's there's, it's just a lovely benchmark. It's you you are you are doing it the same way as everyone else. And it even includes some hilarious rules on the, on the books, like the pilot has to be alive for 30 minutes after landing, which, we, which we've all taken as meaning that when Phil lands, having broken the record attempt, we can put him in a little, little coned off area and we can all sit there and drink champagne and he has to wait 30 minutes before we'll let him out, to, just in case he falls over or something. So no, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant rule sets. It's good. It's, it's, and it's fun looking at those documents and kind of seeing the rules and how they've developed. Sorry, that ties to me also finding it very fun to read about the Spitfire and the Supermarine in my spare time as well. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll hand over back really. No worries. We've got two questions here for you, Phil, about flying the Axel, saying, will you be flying with telemetry and a safety pilot to assist for decision making? And Another one asking visibility on the approach and especially the flare must be a problem. Is your practice focused here? Yeah, two two great questions. Alan has a lot of flight test experience in, <laughs> yeah. um, and, a, and a really good question and, and Charles likewise. So um, let's go for Charles's the visibility on approach. Um, it's not as bad as we anticipated and I can lightly kick the nose out of the way with a bit of side slip, although we're a bit wary of side slip in this aeroplane because, because of the stall characteristics and departure characteristics. Um, as soon as I come into the flare, um, then I lose almost all of that forward visibility and I'm relying just on peripheral. Um, hence, a clearly marked, um, and, and you know, what is lovely is colour differentiation. Um, and, and, and a nice wide runway, but a lot of practice on that ride 
wide runway. So I think they were saying, are you focusing on this in, in your training? And, and yeah, very much so. So we're landing the extra in such a way as to simulate that, which is effectively a tail down wheeler. We're flying it on, we're certainly not stalling it. A little bit of forward carefully, a little bit of forward stick to stick it onto the ground, and then actually an increasing forward push force to try and resist the tail going down too early um, and, and, and helping with my visibility. And then it's just getting my eyes flicking and 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 working on my peripheral so um so uh, really really good question input we think we're on top of it what worries us is is there will be things we're not on and then yes we are flying with telemetry um and for, for what we've put together the team have put together a very very good telemetry system um which we clearly haven't proven yet because we haven't flown we've tried to prove it in other airplanes but it's it's um, you know it's not the real thing, uh, but we're confident. And yeah, um, there's a safety pilot and a lot of advice in telemetry and a lot of practice. Telemetry is something we're practicing, practiced it on the ground taxi. Um, we've got more practicing to do as to how they, because yeah, it's, it's our own little baby mission control and, and mission control for, for all the um, NASA, you know, how you coordinate that room and how you get people a voice and and you know, it, it's fascinating and really important. Um, and also we have a chase aeroplane, uh, which I've insisted on for probably the first three flights, maybe longer. Um, but what is a chase aeroplane looking for? You know, it's not an internal combustion engine. All my sights, sounds and 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 impressions and feelings from 40 years of aviation nearly. Obviously, I started age five. Um, are um, a different. So, what's a chase looking for? But if the undercarriage gets stuck, if you know, I want uh, a, a trusted friend um, very close to me in another airplane. So. One from James asking: How many cycles do you get out of the batteries in record-breaking mode? Come back, Matthew. <laughs> Sorry. Leave me now. <laughs> I, was getting, I was offloading <laughs> my other project. Um, and it's a great question. So when you when you do the eight minute profile are you, you, and you're doing those eight C discharges, we allow the temperature in the battery to get to get to, to increase up to about 80 degrees, which is about the limit. So we are putting the batteries under stress in, in that environment. We, we believe on the math that we've done at the moment that we lose about 0.2 percent of state of charge every time we do the record run so the record run five times you can lose a percent and then so you know 500 flights say would be the theoretical maximum but of course you never fiddle a battery all the way to 100 percent. you never empty it probably below about 20 so so let's say 300 flights you can probably get out of the aircraft um we uh, we're only you know in our record run attempt and our work up you know with this aircraft probably going to fly less than 50 times in total so we're really comfortably within that safety margins but what it does drive us to do of course is just try and get to that record attempt as fast as possible we can't go spend 100 hours just you know slowly opening the envelope we are going to open the envelope in a really careful and mindful way but we have to also do it in a way that gets us gets us the speed record attempt fast because otherwise we're leaving speed on the table the longer it takes us to get there the more we degraded the battery in that process we've left speed on the table and we don't want to do that either there's a couple of great questions from jim it's almost like a flight alt audit it's not <laughs> Amina, can we take those questions from Jim? Is that OK? Yes, yeah, of course. Carry um, on. <laughs> could you highlight the data system on board and all the telemetry? I, I, Matthew, I don't know if we want to do that now, whether we want to take that offline with Jim, who knows quite a bit about flight tests. So we can, we can um, do that really quick. So, so essentially, we have a motorsport system. So we, um, we, we, as you would expect, when we started this project, we went out and we talked to organisations that work in this area. So we went to McLaren. Um, we went to uh, Williams and we sat down with them and talked about motorsport systems and what they have. We've ended up with a Bosch system, um, which is which, which comes out of motorsports with its own telemetry um, broadcast back. Um, but I, I, well, I'd, I'd kind of like to highlight more than that than it's, than it's Bosch is actually we've, we've, we, we looked at that kind of control room setup and Phil described it as that NASA kind of setup and said, well, we need we need that we need analytics we need to be able to look at the data we need to be able to understand what's going on so we've worked with r squared um, data labs 
um, in the team in Bangalore, and they've done a fantastic job of sort of setting up a cloud-based solution so we can post our data, we can get all the analytics working quite quickly, and we can, you know, fundamentally we can optimize the profile and try and try and get that, that faster speed around the course possible. And, and then Jim's other question about safety pilots. I think we've probably got there actually without without realizing it. And um, so uh, uh, what we call a chase airplane, spotter airplane, Jim calls it, um, probably for the first three flights. And I'd just say probably because it depends what we find in those three flights. And um, certainly those three, possibly fourth and fifth, although I think by then we'll 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 uh, leave it behind. Um, and um, and. And we've got a very experienced extra pilot who's also been um, very close to the project who will fly the chase airplane. Uh, I hope uh, one of our one of our pilots in flight ops, a guy called Chris Hadley, and we'll probably have someone significant in the front seat. And by significant, I mean someone from the project who can help. So I've got some advice you know, right next to me. I've got advice in the um, telemetry room, um, and it's it's just a question now of managing that advice because. Yeah, so I'm not swamped, swamped with it. Thanks both. Then we've got a question from Rob saying, what has been the greatest challenge so far? Quite an interesting one, that. Maybe, maybe we both have a go at this, Phil. What's been your greatest challenge so far? And you can't say wait. <laughs> um, I'm also worried I've upset Jim by talking about the audits. I was only joking, Jim. Um, What's been my greatest challenge? Go on, you you go, and I'll and I'll um, I I feel, yeah, you know, I'm I've done the easy bit. I've just watched some brilliant engineers, um, I, and and um, I don't know. It's all been incredible, um, and fascinating and rewarding. Um, I don't know. So. Uh so there's three there's three big technical challenges in the project, which is you know how do you how do you integrate that 500 horsepower system into such a small aircraft? How do you uh, develop a batch room that was that was power dense, energy dense enough to get in there? And how do of course do you do all of that in an airworthy manner and, and keep 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 the pilot safe in, in the mission program? But but I think more than that has been as we've gone through this program, I think we've broken everything pretty much at least once you know we've, we've broken the motors we've broken the batteries we've broken the inverters and and the team has 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 taken that person as we've gone through because we've all invested so much phil described before it's not it's not money it's lives that have kind of gone into the project for the past three years and and i think the greatest challenge and the greatest success has, has been people picking themselves up after those failures because some of them have been you know, we've lost months because we've done something we've had to learn and correct and keeping going and keeping pushing to go get the record, I think, has been been one of the great challenges, one of the great achievements of the team and, and the passion you know, the team has had has, has allowed us to do that. And I, I'm very conscious it, it probably sounds weak to, to not have been able to clearly articulate, but my my challenge is 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 the latter bit, um, you know, the, the not and, I, and I'm desperately conscious of, of all the work that's gone into it. Um, and, and it's about getting that right and the planning. I think the balance, getting the balance right between you know, my day job and, and being able to isolate this, which I've done with the help of a lot of people in my team and a lot of people on the project. Um, but as I say, my, my biggest challenges are, are, are to come. So the preparation is, you know, it's hard work, but it's the preparation is easy. It, it, it's the delivery you know, for me, and I and yeah, I've delivered the taxi, um, but but you know, I haven't delivered much yet, you know, um, and I'm desperately aware that yeah, you know, my time will come. Yeah, so I'd have to pick up with you there, Phil, and go. That's not right. <laughs> I think the flight operations team has been critical throughout the project. So, so I think the way we've embedded safety culture, the way we've had you guys in the in the in the facilities, the way we've sure. uh, we've approached sort of you know, the planning and the requirements, it's been it's been invaluable. So, no, please please don't feel that way. <laughs> it's definitely. No, I, don't, I, 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 I I I don't. But it's not. 
um, you know, that's not been a challenge in the way that it has to people whose components have fallen over and, and things haven't worked as, as planned. And we've had to replan things and work around things. And, and you know, um, yeah. Yeah. But I think I think those failures, you know, the success of the whole project hangs on those failures. The success of the project hangs on the, you know, just 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 all the learning. You know, this is about innovation. This is about working out how to how to produce such a high performing machine. And you know, we were always going to fail along the route. And I think the the flexibility that we've been given by Rolls Royce and the way that we've gone and operated this project slightly off site, um, and we, we've just we sort of managed a lot of this in our own internal governance um, as uh, uh, pulling on Rolls Royce when we've needed has been really powerful. Great, thanks both. <laughs> and then we've had two questions um, relating to regeneration. So one saying, does the power unit slash system feature regenerate like that of a regenerative braking on an EV slash car? And one saying, do you use any regenerative energy recovery through the prop in the slowdown prior to your turns after each run? Um, so we we don't know. Um, so we, we we deliberately in the whole project kind of went with the process of just just keep it as simple as possible. So we decided to operate the the motors and inverters in what we call single quadrant mode. So so not 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 allowing regeneration. But actually, when we got into it a bit further down the project line, we discovered that the um, because we have a relatively high bus voltage of 750 volts, um, we couldn't actually the system wasn't capable of regenerative braking under the kind of low low currents we would be uh, we would be producing. In uh, low voltage cells, we were producing when we um, when we try and run the base, the winds running against the propeller. So we opted not to do it for simplicity, but actually the system couldn't have done it anyway. Um, it is something to be explored um, a bit further in other areas, but I think really, you know, you, when you start to get, we, we've done some work on it. You, you, when you start to look at the trades, it's it's not quite as efficient, of course, as, 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 as braking with a car to regenerate power into the system, and even then. You know, we watch Formula E. We see, you know, we see those systems in operation and what they do for boost power. But it, it, if you've driven an electric car, you can have a go at being really aggressive with your braking and not. You don't really get that many more miles back normally. Um, it's it is about you know when we think about the wider piece about how we're going to sell electric vehicles. It's more about how can you recharge through a hybrid, or can you, you know, how are you going to make sure you've got the ground infrastructure. Thanks. And we've just got time for one last question. So this is from James saying, is there a record for hybrid powered aircraft? And would that be something you would look to pursue? Um, so I saw this question pop up and I don't know the answer, you know. <laughs> um, I will go have a look and get back to James if he could if he could post in his surname or his email. We'll get back to it. But um, I, was, I was trying to ponder it as well, because you, with a hybrid system, generally we're chasing fuel efficiency. Or, or some sort of performance gain, um, like short takeoff, you know, and, and I'm just trying to work through the trades in my head about whether you would get, you could architect a system for, for better overall speed in a hybrid configuration. And I haven't quite landed on what that configuration would be, um, but I'll have a look at it. It's a brilliant question. It's not something we've got in scope. I think from what we're really clear about this project is it's, a, you know, it is a generational project. Um, it's been a really, you, the Rolls-Royce has broken lots of records over time. You know, the fastest helicopter is still a Rolls-Royce powered helicopter. And we, we've broken lo lots of records through our history. But I think when you go and do it, they are very special moments. And, and for us now in Rolls-Royce Electrical, it's about how do we pivot from breaking a record, demonstrating capability, inspiring people to product. So for us now, it's it's not about going a bit faster. It's about right now, let's go sell this technology because you know, the groups funded us to develop it. Thanks, Eric. And that's about all we've got time for today. So I'll hand over to Paul Ass for the vote of thanks. Right. OK, so yeah, uh, thank you both of you. It's been a, a fantastic uh, evening to listen to you guys. Uh, you touched based on uh, a key uh, or a topical uh, topic right now. Electrification is really new trend across aerospace industries, isn't it? Uh, so that's clearly seen as a 
way forward from cleaner and more sustainable power point of view. An Axel project is clearly intended to pioneer the third wave of aviation to build the world's fastest uh, all electric uh, aircraft. So you also touched base in the uh, during the lecture about uh, uh, adapting uh, zero carbon uh, or carbon neutral uh, whilst looking at to simulate the development of an electric aircraft supply chain and of course also making uh, sure that we run forward for the record book or with a target speed of 300 miles per hour. Um, in that journey, you also took us through uh, a quick rundown of the project and uh, shared briefly the challenges with battery, battery case, for example, at the thermal runaway event. Um, and uh, also, it was fascinating to hear from uh, Phil, especially on the weight reduction. So it's clearly a team game, sports, isn't it? Uh, it's not uh, one in single individual where we can reduce things. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I'm not trying to pick on it, but it's it's a team sports. That's, this is a classic example. So rather than just uh, always looking at uh, each individual component, it could be a bigger team benefit. So yeah, that's that's another uh, fantastic uh, uh, example of working together as a team. Um, uh, Matt, you also put, uh, touched on uh, potential uh, new business opportunities uh, on, on your very la last uh, two slides. So that 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 was really uh, looking uh, looking good and exciting from Rolls Royce point of view. Um, so it's fascinating to see Axel program coming together. Really. Um, um, so on behalf of the Royal Aeronautical Society Derby branch, I would like to thank you uh, for delivering this fa fascinating lecture. Uh, also, I must say, perhaps uh, thanks to the entire uh, project team. And also would like to wish uh, all the best for the speed record. Looking forward to uh, know that it's all been successful. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, oh, thank you, participants as well. Uh, hopefully you guys have enjoyed as well this lecture. Same as us. <laughs> Once again, thank you, Phil and Matt.